Next. Are you sure? You're good. Check this out. We're gonna get in so much trouble. Your turn. Watch this. I'll show them. Whatever. Kashmira, now exclusively at Cardi's Furniture and Mattresses. Will this come off too? Hi, I'm Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. I am very sorry that Senate business keeps me from being with you today, but I am excited to help welcome you to the New England Institute of Technology Climate Panel and the screening of Paris to Pittsburgh. Thank you to the New England Institute of Technology, Renewable Now Network, Foundation for Green Future, and all the wonderful organizations that made this event possible. I speak regularly about the fossil fuel industry's relentless grip on Congress. I often discuss how that grip prevents action on climate change. But despite Congress's failure to take this threat seriously so far, Americans see climate change as a big priority. Climate change demands urgency from all of us, which is why I'm so heartened by all of you coming together to discuss this issue in a positive, thoughtful manner. The effects of climate change will hit New England's coast particularly hard. Rhode Islanders know that sea level rise is no laughing matter. Our local agencies and officials, as well as coastal residents, understand the changes coming. Many of us not only live near the sea, but work and sail and fish on it. So climate change threatens our livelihoods, our livings, even our lives. That's why it's so important that our communities have a voice in shaping their response. Indeed, Rhode Island is already leading the way, becoming home to the nation's first offshore wind facility, manufacturing electric bus bodies, and devoting millions in funding to assess and respond to the effects of climate change on coastal ecosystems. This hard work and smart planning helps us respond to the effects of climate change. I will continue to do battle to stop its causes. We're not out of time yet. We still have a chance to avoid the worst consequences of climate disruption and prepare our coastal infrastructure for the rising tides. I appreciate so much the work all of you are doing to help us get ahead of the coming changes. Thank you. From shifting weather patterns that threaten food production to rising sea levels that increase the risk of catastrophic flooding, the impacts of climate change are global in scope and unprecedented in scale. There is alarming evidence that important tipping points leading to irreversible changes in major ecosystems and the planetary climate system may already have reached or passed. Ecosystems as diverse as the Amazon rainforest and the Arctic tundra may be approaching thresholds of dramatic change through warming, and drying. Mountain glaciers are in alarming retreat and the downstream effects of reduced water supply in the driest months will have repercussions that transcend generations. Hello, I'm Peter Arpin from the Arpin Group and the Renewable Now Network. And I am proud to be introducing this evening's community action event that's addressing climate change Climate change is the defining issue of our time, and we are at a defining moment. Don't let anyone fool you. There is no aspect of our society, our community, and our environment that will not be affected. From business to health to national security, climate change is a threat that needs to be addressed. And this evening, we in New England are going to address that as we present Paris to Pittsburgh to New England, a two-part event that leads off with our Community Action Forum made up of leaders from throughout the region. That include U.S. Representative James Langevin, Mayor Jamie Bova from the city of Newport, Greg Watson, Director of Policy and Systems Design, 
at the Schumacher Center for New Economics and Commissioner of Agriculture in Massachusetts under Governors Michael Dukakis, William Weld, and Deval Patrick. Commanda Andrea Cameron, Military Professor in National Security Affairs Department and Founding Director of the Climate and Human Security Studies Group at the U.S. Naval War College. Juan Lopez, Director of Research and Policy for the City of Boston, Massachusetts. Attorney Deborah Brown, Special Counsel to EPA, New England's Director of Civil Rights and Urban Affairs. Troy Moon, Sustainability Coordinator and Manager of Smart City for Portland, Maine. Lynn Stoddard, Executive Director of Sustainable Connecticut and the Institute for Sustainable Energy at Eastern Connecticut State University. And Lisa Bitterman, Business Development Manager at EcoMaine in Portland. Following the forum, our studio audience will be presented with a screening of Paris to Pittsburgh, a new documentary from National Geographic produced by Radical Media in partnership with Bloomberg Philanthropies. This film examines the disastrous consequences of climate change and celebrates the stories of those taking action against it. Before we begin this evening's event, I want to personally thank National Geographic and the Bloomberg Philanthropies for partnering with RNN and the Foundation for a Green Future in helping us to bring this to you. I also want to thank Cardi's Furniture and Mattress and the Arpin Group for their great help and of course, our event partner, the New England Institute of Technology. And on a personal side, I would like to thank Dr. Nancy Cariolo, whose never ending commitment to environmental issues has truly made a difference in the state of Rhode Island and has also been a great help with the event. Thank you, Nancy. And now, coming to you from the beautiful campus of the New England Institute of Technology in East Greenwich, Rhode Island, we bring you Paris to Pittsburgh to New England with your host and moderator, Dr. Karen Weber of the Foundation for a Green Future. So I want to let you know what this award is about. It's presented to those individuals and organizations who stand out among their peers for raising climate awareness and promoting environmental education in the community. It's primarily to direct attention to the importance of the environment, encourage commitment to sustainability by students, community organizations, individuals, increase that community understanding an interest in environmental education by involving them in events, workshops, classes, and other creative ventures. We also hope that through this, the work that people do as recipients of this award, that they will further engage the community in all things green. So to begin with, I'd like to present this amazing Eco Educator Award to Representative Langevin. So let's put this down there. Oh, great. Now. Thank you very much for the award. I'm, I'm truly, truly honored. And to that, since you would like to speak a little bit, we also want to make sure that he frames his speech to this question. So given the work that you have done over the past years as representative in the Congress since 2000, the year 2000, and a founding member and of the Energy Task Force of the House's Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition. We, would, one, we were wondering if you would be able to put things into perspective about the importance of taking action when it comes to climate change and tell us what your office is doing. Very good. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, let me say what a distinct privilege and an honor it is for me to be here with everyone tonight. And uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Weber for uh, for her comments and for her leadership in helping to facilitate uh, this evening's discussion and this event. I also want to acknowledge Ed uh, Catucci uh, and the Renewable Now uh, Network for putting this event together. I know you're in for a, a wonderful panel discussion tonight on a very, very important topic. And I know that uh, 
Senator Whitehouse uh, either has spoken or he will be speaking uh, by, by video. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Senator Whitehouse's leadership. Uh, he is our fearless leader uh, when it comes to uh, fighting for uh, awareness of climate change and trying to combat the effects of climate change. And I'm grateful for his friendship, uh, his leadership in the United States Senate, uh, and uh, all the work that he is doing. Uh, we are truly partners with him in, in his effort. And I know I speak on behalf of our uh, entire congressional delegation. Um, first of all, uh, I also want to thank everyone for participating here tonight. Dr. Nancy Cariolo <coughs> helped facilitate my being here uh, this evening. I want to acknowledge her. I know that she had a, uh, a family emergency and couldn't, uh, couldn't attend. Let me just say uh, right off the bat that uh, we all know what is by now, I think, just self-evident, that climate change is real, uh, it is happening, and we have got to come to grips uh, with, as a nation with what we are going to do next. And uh, if this is not a go-it-alone prospect. This is a, uh, a challenge that confronts the world uh, right now. Uh, it was a travesty that uh, President Trump pulled the United States out of the Paris Agreement. Uh, it was a historic agreement with 175 uh, signatories. And I actually was in Estonia at the time when, uh, that, uh, when the President announced that he was withdrawing from the, uh, from the agreement. And it was not met well uh, with the, by, by myself or uh, European partners around the, around the, uh, around the world. The, uh, the Congress and the House of Representatives, uh, now that uh, we have a Democratic majority, is a, uh, as a renewed focus on this and is working on both highlighting and passing legislation, both raising awareness but also trying to, uh, it will hopefully combat the effects of climate change and transition us over to a, uh, a, a new green economy. Uh, my office is certainly focused on this and I'm proud to be a original uh, founding member of the Sustainable Energy and Environmental Coalition. There are a group of us who, uh, who have band together as a, making this a, a, an issue of significance and importance in trying to uh, raise awareness and uh, promote legislation uh, that will that both uh, uh, reverse the effects of climate change but uh, educate others about uh, what we can do uh, as a country uh, to show more leadership in this, in this area. One thing I'll, I'll mention that uh, I'm very proud of um, and I'll, I'll wind up this, I know you want to get on with the panel. We often talk about uh, climate change from a, an environmental perspective, uh, a, a, uh, an economic perspective. We don't necessarily always talk about it in, in terms of how it affects our national security. Uh, I have the privilege of serving as a senior member of the House Armed Services Committee. And so in the 2018 National Defense Authorization Act, I authored an amendment that made it into the, uh, the uh, NDAA and then uh, passed ultimately in Congress that required uh, each of our uh, services uh, to to identify uh, those top ten most vulnerable uh, bases, the effects of climate change, uh, what they're doing to, uh, to to deal with those effects, how we're going to mitigate the effects, and the costs associated with it. It also required all of our uh, our, our combat commanders uh, to determine how this is going to affect our uh, strategic uh, posture going forward, how it's going to affect their their uh, military planning. Now, the Pentagon came back to us with a report that totally missed the mark and not surprisingly. So, uh, given the pressure they were under from the president and the administration to ignore climate change or pretend that it doesn't happen, we got, we went back at them and we're going to continue uh, to require that they that they address this and we get the information that we need because it's happening and we have to take this seriously as a country. And it is affecting our national security, and we have to get this right. I am encouraged by the people in this room, the leadership that we're seeing around the around the world, to let uh, everyone know that uh, even though the president has uh, removed the United States from the Paris Agreement, that we are still in. We are not going away, and that uh, we're in this together, and we're going to do everything we can to make sure that. Uh, we continue to show the leadership that is necessary, and we are we're seeing it, by the way, at the, the local, state, and uh, in other areas, the the, uh, the the federal level. That if the the federal government, if the president has pulled this out of the climate Paris Climate Agreement, that states are now uh, starting to act on their own. 
there are things that we can do to reduce our carbon footprint and uh, and uh, transition us to a, a new green economy. Uh, our fate as a country and where the world is at stake, and we cannot rest on our laurels. We have to take this with the uh, the seriousness that it uh, that it deserves. Thank so, you so thank much. Thank you all very much. It's an honor to be with you tonight. I hope you enjoy the time. <laughs>
sending out these uh, signals that is, nothing is happening. That scares me because there's a lot of places where, where people believe what, what they're fed, you know, because they don't even have uh, water to drink and, and they're worried about day to day. And those are the most impacted sometimes the voices. That's what scares me the most. Go ahead, Troy. Um, as someone who works in local government, um, our charge is to um, support our community members and you know to keep a, live, a very livable uh, community, and that takes a lot of resources. Um, one of the problems I see coming forward is um, the need to you know invest more resources into climate resilience and infrastructure programs that uh, protect um, the seacoast, protect property, but also at the same time um, having to fund. Uh, programs to support um, you know the residents' um, social and health needs as well. So I think you know as, as climate change uh, takes more effect, we'll see more hot days. Um, so you know there'll be more public health impacts. So there'll be more resources needed for those sort of day-to-day -day responses. Um, there'll be you know greater storms, a more need for emergency uh, response funds. Um, and so just having all of these uh, factors coming together that require investment of both you know human and financial capital. Um, I'm concerned that those resources are going to be a real challenge for particularly local governments, but even on a state and national scale, I think we're going to find that to be a big challenge. And Greg? Yeah, I guess one of my biggest concerns is um, whether or not we will be able to muster the levels of cooperation that are going to be needed to actually address the problem, and this is an existential threat, um, and it's going to take uh, really some coordinated action that we look for. I don't think that's the only body that we live on a planet with limited resources. Um, I, I look at our efforts of, of establishing the Renewable Energy Trust Fund a number of years ago and our efforts to establish offshore wind. Just one quick example. Everyone, uh, there's an opportunity for us to uh, understand that there are roles for each one of the states, for instance, to play. Every, every state can't be a hub, but every port that we can build can actually build upon and create some synergy with other facilities. And we're sort of missing those opportunities. So what happens, at, and that's happening at sort of the, the, the local level, it's happening at the state level, but unfortunately it's also happening at the global level. So we've got to figure out how we can be a bit more strategic, how we can start to be a bit more tactical, you know, again, sort of be, be tactical in terms of how we're going to actually address this and cooperation has got to play a major role in that. Thank you, and Mayor Bova. Uh, from a local government perspective for Newport, what I am the most concerned about is water management. Uh, we're seeing increased flooding uh, from sea level rise and from increased rainfall from heavier and more frequent storms. Uh, and so we're dealing with the water management during those flood events, but also the effects on our drinking water and stormwater runoff and our wastewater, um, especially because our wastewater treatment facility is in a rather low-lying area. Uh, and could definitely be affected by increased sea level rise. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, with all of those worries and all of those increased uh, concerns comes also the question of how do we pay for it all? Uh, it's a consistent question in city government, um, no matter what you're talking about. But it, when you're trying to convince people to pay now to stop something from happening that they're being told, eh, it's probably not gonna really happen anyway. Uh, it's hard to necessarily, and humans are, are bad at planning. <laughs> so it, it's um, a constant struggle to figure out how to find the funding, how to convince people that it's um, a real issue, um, and, and that it's going to continue to get worse unless we uh, do something now. So thank you, each of you. This has been a, a wonderful spectrum of responses from the panel. And it looks like they're talking locally, nationally, internationally, the impact of climate change is not just in Rhode Island or Massachusetts or <coughs> Connecticut or New Hampshire or Maine or Vermont. It is everywhere, but we start here. And some of the issues that they raised have social repercussions, resource ramifications, safety and security, energy, water management, sea level rise, and budget. And then finally, apathy. So let us look now a little deeper into uh, where each expertise lies amongst the panelists and get a sense of um, a little bit more about each of these areas. So I'm going to turn now to Lisa Bitterman from EcoMaine. 
And given your frontline experience with waste management and witnessing the issues of recycling across more than 70 municipalities in Maine that you just referred to in terms of your concern for climate, how do you see the industry as a whole able to help with combating climate change? So at EcoMaine, we kind of live and die by uh, something called the solid waste hierarchy. It is a recommendation by the uh, EPA as to how to best manage materials that you want to get rid of at the end of the day, be it trash, be it food scraps, be it just unwanted or broken items. Um, think of it like the food pyramid, but upside down. So you want to do as much as you can at the highest levels or the highest rungs of the hierarchy. So every self-respecting second grader knows reduce, reuse, recycle. Those come first, then compost or digestion, then waste to energy power plants, and then lastly, landfill. Landfill's at the little itty bitty tip of the, uh, of the waste hierarchy, and so we're hoping to do the least of it as possible. Um, so in our industry, we have a unique opportunity to educate our constituents, educate our customers around peeling off or diverting material at the highest rungs of the hierarchy first. So before you even think about recycling something, did you need to buy it in the first place or could you uh, give it to someone, donate it, reuse it in some other different method? Um, so, you know, we really feel that promoting the hierarchy is our paramount responsibility and to teach people how to manage waste in the most responsible manner so that we're filling up our landfills as slowly as possible with materials that could have been put to a better and higher use. Thank you so much. Um, I have a quick question for you as a follow-on. Uh, in terms of Maine, are you finding that, what point are you with, the, with your landfills at this point? Are you at 50%? Are you at 70%? I can't speak to the raw waste landfills in the state. Um, I'm not an expert on those. Uh, I can speak to the landfill that Ecomain owns. Uh, we actually call it an ash fill landfill because we um, combust 180,000 tons of solid waste at our waste to energy power plant every year. We use that to produce energy and we, um, we reduce the volume of the material by 90% into a stabilized ash. So our landfill is 274 acres, and we um, a while ago had projected that it would be at capacity in somewhere around 2040, 2044. Uh, we actually are mining the ash in our landfill for ferrous and non-ferrous metals, so we're actually increasing our capacity of our own landfill. And we just signed a 10-year agreement with an organization that's going to go back and mine all of our ash again for even smaller pieces of metal. Um, so we're looking at sometime in 2050 in terms of capacity. Um, with regards to raw waste landfills, they're filling up faster than anyone would ever like to believe. And we're looking at scenarios where municipalities and states are starting to truck waste all over the country. Uh, Maine is not doing that yet, but we are accepting some um, small amounts of waste from other states. And, um, you know, before you know it, they're going to be full in a blink of an eye. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to turn now to Deborah Brown. She spent the better amount of her life working for the protection of the environment at the EPA, advocating for environmental justice converting brownfields, helping with compliance regarding toxic chemicals and pesticides. You've worked in the states of Texas, New York, and Massachusetts. You understand that in general, climate change hits underserved populations the hardest. What can be done to reduce or eliminate the impact of climate change on underrepresented communities? I, I think one of the things that has to happen is that there has to be this acknowledgement that, that everybody is in this. And, and further, that just because everybody's in it doesn't mean that everybody's in it equally. And, and that means from the standpoint of, of uh, being adversely impacted. For example, if you look at who generates uh, the more CO2, it's, it's generally white people. 
And when you turn around and then look at who is most impacted by it, uh, Latinos and African Americans. So, you know, that's part of a conversation that has to take place. I mean, when we talk about climate change, I, I, I think one of the, the biggest mistakes that we make is we try to talk about it strictly in the context of science. And you know what? 30 years that the Environmental Protection Agency has taught me that even in science, we look at issues through our own lens, through our own social lens. So depending on where we come from, that will drive our ability uh, to at least initially acknowledge what the issues are. And, and my hope is that, you know, as, as we begin to appreciate that this ship literally and metaphorically is going to rise, we are all going to rise and sink on the same boat. Some of us may be at the bottom of the boat or the pr proverbial canary in the mine, but let us not be confused. We are all taking on water. And, and so whether it's a, a, part of it is a function of, 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 of self-survival, but it's also we have to appreciate that, that these are moral issues too. I mean, at their core, you know, what, what I am talking about is, is, is looking at Brian and saying, Brian, see me as a human being. See me as part of this environment, vast environmental network and, and not as uh, someone subservient to you, but an equal in terms of problem solving or for that matter, problem creation. So that's, that's my, my backdrop. Uh, I, I do want to say that over the years, and, and I first met Greg, my God, many, many years ago. And you know what we were doing? We, we were doing environmental justice work. And when, when we flipped the lens a little bit in, in 2019, it has severe or significant climate implications. Uh, you know, working with Native people, the issues that they're talking about up in Maine or, you know, in, in Massachusetts, there, there's a climate overlay. And they're doing the work. You know, I was thinking about uh, just in terms of uh, community gardens. Uh, they're big in Boston. You know, people are getting them off the ground in a town as, as economically devastated as Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, green jobs. They, they opened up a, a, a pop-up market. Well, guess where that food was going if it didn't go to the pop-up market? To the landfill. And so it, you may not see it. You may not expect to see it. But there's a lot of work going on in our urban centers, in our poorer areas. And that for that, we're so grateful. All right. So pass it off. It sounds like from what you're saying is in spite of the challenge of climate change for the potential racial divide that we're seeing and the, and the, the environmental inequities that we see, that you have hope. And that this climate change issue, in fact, is one that may, in fact, be the one that helps bring us together and do the right thing. Oh, yeah, I have hope. OK. I have hope. So on that note, I'm going to move on to the Latino community. Senor Lopez. In this case, instead of your interviewing me on political, <laughs> Politica Entre Amigos, it's my turn. Well, Juan. On this thing, like, like, like using, for instance, we're all in the Titanic together. The thing is that, that the Titanic, you know, it couldn't be sunk, whatever, you know. But we, we only have one plan. So we have to make sure that we're all banging the drums. And, and speaking about drums, one of the things that we need to do is listen to everyone. Because there are solutions. I, as I interview folks from all over Peru, different places, and they have so many answers. Sometimes we, we speak in silos. Oh, this is the scientific way. We have to worry about 
their profit and loss and this, but all of that can be can be taken care of. But we have to realize that this is our only vessel, and we have to 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 see that there are so many answers already. Uh, I I've spoken to to folks from from the Andes and. The, they, they, they showed me like seven different straws that, that you can use that are not plastic. They use it all the time. And, and a lot of times we, we're not listening to a lot of these old ideas that we already have. The thing is we're going so fast forward with the technology and all the throwaway things that we forget there, there are so many answers. So what we, can we do to develop, help? Educate okay, and, and listen to each other. Because a lot nothing is new now. There is, you know, there's a lot of... And, and, and the folks that are experiencing these things, they have a lot of answers. But sometimes they are not in the in, in forums or in any place like this because you know they don't have the, the, the means to do that. And, and and the folks that sometimes drive these things are those that that uh, basically have the means and, and we we're living in a place where all, that is the only consideration. You know, how can we gain from this and forget it? That this is our life. This is everyone. So you know the luxury seats, and like you said, or anybody that that is you know an employee. We have to love the planet, love each other, and start really getting ideas from each other because there's so much out there. One example, for instance, and I, I advise, uh, recommend that everybody sees uh, is a documentary on Cuba, and you know all the political things that are happening here. You know. It's, back and forth, depending on whose side you are and so on. But what happened was the Russians did not give Cuba any more fertilizer, chemical fertilizer. And, and then all of a sudden, they were forced to go back to the oxen and do everything organically. So, and please see it, it's in the Museum of Science in World War. And what happened is, after 10 years or so, guess what, Mother Nature, very resilient and powerful and wonderful. And all of that bleaching that we're talking about, it's reverse. You have to see it. And we know that. We have a lot of answers. In Massachusetts, we have MIT, we have Harvard, we got the, the know-how. But now what we need to have is that heart in it and know that this is it. We have to protect this one vessel and we have to do it together. All of us. All colors, all nationalities. Forget about the flag, the politics. Is for everyone, and I think that's the main. So the main does that thing. mean that we forget about looking at the issues of the Latino community and how they their needs need to be met for climate change? Well, see, the thing is, it's not like this is a Latino answer. To, even in that, it, it, it's, it's all of us. And yes, we need to listen to what you know the Puerto Ricans are doing. If you want to know about survival in a, in a, in a storm, you talk to Puerto Ricans. And if you don't want to know how many ways you can use a bucket right. or a can. You talk to them, and, and in Haiti, and so on. And that's what we need in St. Croix, and, 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 and the places that are already having to live on stilts and so on. So that's what we need to do, bring everybody in. And it's, it's the human family's uh, issue. Muchisimas gracias. Thank you, Juan. I'd like to turn now to our friend Greg Watson. Dating back to 1990, as you heard earlier, he has been commissioner of, the, of agriculture for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts under our governors Dukakis, Weldon, Patrick. Greg, you may be aware that there's an article in the New York Times posted in 2018 that states that the world's food system is responsible for about one quarter of the planet warming greenhouse gases that humans generate each year. That includes raising and harvesting all the plants, animals, animal products that we eat, beef, chicken, fish, milk, lentils, kale, corn, and more, as well as the processing, packaging, and shipping of food to the markets all over the world. You're well aware that agriculture is a big problem when it comes to climate change. Is this getting the attention it deserves? And what do we need to do in your mind to mitigate its impact? Uh, you know, the concerns are warranted. Uh, back in 1980, I worked at a little place called the New Alchemy Institute on Cape Cod. I'm not sure if anybody knows what the New Alchemy yeah, Institute was. Yeah. Okay, anybody with gray hair probably. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, uh, uh, the, it, it emerged from Earth Day, but you know, most of the folks, a lot of the folks that emerged from Earth Day were very secure in their feelings about what was wrong with the world. Uh, you know, industrial agriculture, fossil fuel, 
um, uh, fossil fuels and all, but new alchemy was one of the rare exceptions of a think do tank that emerged and said, we need to find out what the alternatives are. Is there a different way to do it? And not having a lot to go on, they, in the words of Buckminster Fuller, dared to be naive. And they looked to nature as the model for designing life support systems for humans. And what that led to was, again, organic agriculture, a little, you know, and, and, and organic agriculture that allowed us to raise enough food on a tenth of an acre of land to feed 13 people, three vegetable portions a day without the use of any chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides. Now, what we didn't know at the time was that we were also addressing what is now a, a, one of, or at least developing a tool for mitigating climate change because the organic methods also improve the, the quality of the soil. You know, fertilizers basically break down the soils, there's no structure, and basically everything sieves out. When you build it using organic techniques like they did in Cuba, I visited Cuba for uh, about five times as commissioner of agriculture to learn from them what they're doing and how they're applying it to their urban environment. Um, but what we find is that the structure is one that can sequester carbon. It also prevents erosion. It also increases the nutrient density of the <coughs> soil, which means that the food that we eat is healthier and more nutritious. Nature never does just one thing. The world is interconnected. So there are a bunch, so when you when you design, you try to do those multiple things and rather than having the inadvertent uh, unintended consequences, you build in the beneficial consequences. Let me just say the other thing that we did that was also a precursor to climate change is that we focus on season extenders. Massachusetts New England has a very short growing season. So we figured, is there a way for us to grow food longer without having, once again, to revert to fossil fuels? And we dare to be naive there. And basically said, how does the planet moderate temperature? It's with water. That's why the plant, you know, 75% water. And water slowly takes in heat energy and then slowly releases it when the air temperature comes cool. We built tanks inside of these greenhouses. And rather than have them be um, just tanks of 55-gallon drums, paint them black because black absorbs the heat, but it takes up a lot of space, and it's unused space. So John Todd, Dr. Todd, Dr. Bill McClarney, Nancy T Todd, and the folks at New York, we said, let's raise fish in these. Mm -hmm. So they were translucent tanks, right? And so the, 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 the heat could come in, heat the water, we raise a tropical fish, tilapia, real quick, but the most important thing there was, once again, Nature doesn't do just one thing. The byproducts of one system are always the inputs of another. Mm -hmm. So we took a small wind-powered pump and took the water inside the tank that was becoming, you know, with the environment of those tanks with a bunch of fish in them, right? It becomes, uh, it, it's wastewater, but we converted that from wastewater to nutrient-rich mm -hmm. water, to a resource by pumping it slowly through a hydroponic system that had lettuce, tomatoes, and cucumbers dangling in vermiculite. <laughs> but taking the fish waste, now nutrients, and purifying the water so we can recirculate them back into the tanks. In, a, in, a, in an uncertain climate future where we don't know how the temperature is going to fluctuate, food is, well, I'm just saying, in, food is our canary in the climate in mind, right? A little, too, we could talk about sea level rise, and those are bad, and a lot of things are going to happen, but slight changes in temperature. A number of years ago, it was a little ice age, and by the way, the little ice age was a two degree drop in temperature. And it led to massive starvation and suffering. And we're talking now about an increase. It doesn't matter when it, that fluctuation can wreak havoc on, especially a highly centralized food production system. So local agriculture, looking at these techniques, building this healthy soils. So Massachusetts a healthy soils initiative that's just now being, being formulated so that we create these soils that can, among other things, all the other beneficial things, but the most important this discussion, it can help we, we, can, we can emit less carbon, and, and we've got to stop, right, with the, with the greenhouse gas emissions, but we also have to pull some of that, as much as we can, out of the atmosphere, and healthy soils with healthy plants growing can help that. So we didn't know we were doing it at the time, but this is definitely an organization that was ahead of its time, and unfortunately, the times have caught up. Well, thank you for giving some insights into the potentials of food insecurity at the same time as food security. Uh, so I'd like to turn now to Troy Moon, who is the sustainability coordinator for the city of Portland, Maine, and manager of Portland's Smart City Campaign. The city of Portland has, quote unquote, committed to reducing community-wide greenhouse gas emissions 80% by the year 2050, and transitioning to 100% clean energy for municipal operations by 2040. 
Troy, you've been helping to implement the smart city initiatives and achieve these goals. How is it going? Are these goals sufficient? Are, is the community of Portland with you on this? And if I'm going too fast, I'll repeat the questions <laughs> after if you need. But if they are with you, in what way? If not, what are the barriers that you're seeing and how can you overcome them? Sure. Um, and it was interesting, the Representative Longevin mentioned uh, that you know, President Trump had withdrawn from uh, the Paris Climate Accord. So our goal of reducing emissions 80% by 2050 um, or a response uh, to, to that action, our city council um, committed to uh, adopt those, to make sure that the city of Portland would achieve those goals and, and adopt, you know, join the mayors and uh, state governments around the country and around the world in, in embracing that goal. Um, so what they did is they asked us to, uh, to begin a climate action and adaptation planning process, which uh, we are joining with our neighboring city of South Portland to develop a joint plan uh, to, to achieve those goals. And we know that um, you know, there's, even if we are able to reduce our emissions to achieve those goals, there's certainly impacts of climate change that are already locked in. We could stop emitting today, and we know that we could probably <laughs> still see you know, two feet or more of sea level rise in, you know, in Casco Bay and around Portland Harbor. And so we want to make sure that we adapt to those, but we also want to uh, um, make sure that our communities remain uh, vibrant and livable places. So I'm really um, glad to hear so much talk about inclusion. One of the key parts of um, our climate action and adaptation planning process is talking to as many people in the community as we can. We want to talk to new mayors. We're a refugee resettlement community. We want to make sure that we talk to folks who have just come to, uh, to Portland. A lot, oftentimes they come from other parts of the country and they've learned skills and, they have and ways to deal with adversity that I think we can learn a lot from. Uh, we want to talk you know, to parents of children and, and seniors. And you know, I think uh, you know, city staff and consultants could certainly sit around a table and come up with a pretty credible plan to deal with, with the technical aspects, but I think it's really important that the community buy into them. Um, in our communities, we're blessed to have um, citizens that are very engaged on, on climate issues and environmental issues <coughs> in general. Uh, for instance, um, you know, our Portland Climate Action Team is uh, it's made up of residents who are advocate for climate action. Uh, they were certainly instrumental in, in getting our council to adopt these goals. Um, we have a pesticide ban. We have probably the most strict pesticide ordinance in the country that completely bans synthetic pesticides um, and promoting organic agriculture and organic lawn care. And that was really a grassroots movement. Um, residents in the community are very concerned about um, you know, health of the public and particularly Casco Bay. We're, on, you know, we're right on the water and Casco Bay is important to our, you know, our, to our culture but also to our economy, both our fishing, you know, fishing industry and, and tourism. So people care a lot about having pesticides potentially running into the into the bay. So, you know, that was it was the public who, who was engaged in that and really brought forward um, that ordinance. Um, and just in all those areas, um, the public is very engaged, and often we have almost have trouble keeping up with the action that they want. So it's a it's a good problem to have, and we're really pleased about that. But on the technology side. Um, our city manager particularly is very intrigued in how we can um, adopt technology to improve services and be uh, more efficient. Um, because, you know, again, with limited resources and challenges, how can we harness um, innovation um, to be more effective, to respond more effectively to, uh, to climate issues? Uh, so, for instance, we've just adopted uh, smart traffic signals. That's adaptive and uh, they respond to traffic as, as they you know, come to an intersection. They, instead of having just a timer that goes around and around, um, we have sensors established that can detect the vehicles that come and, and you know, have the most efficient timing of the signals so traffic doesn't have to wait and idle. Um, in some of the intersections we've deployed, we've seen wait times diminish by 20 seconds per vehicle, which um, is more convenient for residents, but also more vehicles can go through. And also we have, uh, we're not emitting, uh, we're not emitting you know, emissions from vehicles idling. And we just recently installed um, LED streetlights uh, across the city, which reduced our municipal electrical consumption by about 8%. So you know, th those are just some of the things we're starting to work on, and we're pleased to have the support of our residents and our 
and our city council to do, the, do that work. So in fact, you're not seeing too many barriers. It sounds like the initiatives you're taking are well received. They are. Um, again, we're a coastal community and people, you know, we can see it. We've, you know, we, you know, we actually can see uh, sea level rise happening in our community. For instance, in our Bayside community, which is the lowest part of, uh, of the city, um, we have blue, you know, blue sky flooding now. We could have on a, on a you know, high tide, on a lunar high tide, uh, we have standing water um, in that neighborhood um, to the point now that we watch our tide charts um, and if the, the tides are a certain height, we dispatch the public works department to set up barricades on several streets so people don't uh, go down them and get you know, salt water in their cars. Or on a, if there happened to be a storm surge, they might come back and find their car under water. So, that, so that's literally something we've had to do in the last couple of years. And that's a, we just, you know, so it's just a sign of, that things are changing rapidly. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, one thing that came from what you just mentioned was something that I heard from Deb and Juan and Greg and, and to some extent Lisa, but the grassroots, mentioning the grassroots. So this is something that's coming from city officials, from our elected officials uh, and from our, our, our industries to try to do something on one end, but really the grassroots rise from the other is something that I, I, I like the fact that you're bringing that out. So I would like to turn to Lynn Stoddard, who's also involved with some of the grassroots as executive director for the Institute for Sustainable Energy at Eastern Connecticut State University, heading up Sustainable Connecticut, uh, which is a voluntary certification program to help create communities that are resilient. And you've had over 20 years of experience in the areas of climate change, energy efficiency, recycling, solid waste planning, pollution prevention, and coastal area management. What do you see are the greatest strides the state of Connecticut has made toward combating climate change? And do you have recommendations that can be valuable for the other New England states? Sure, well, so Connecticut's fortunate, we're all fortunate to be part of New England, which has been really at the forefront of addressing climate change. In 2001, the New England governors and Eastern Canadian premier, premiers had the first regional goals for climate change and greenhouse gas reductions. So that's great. We maybe haven't made as much progress as we could have. Um, so I believe that the greatest leverage point is at the local level and the grassroots roots level. So a couple of years ago, we convened a, a lot of mayors from around Connecticut and said, let's create a vision <coughs> to help you become more sustainable in your communities and address some of these issues. And we created the program Sustainable CT, which has been up for about a year and a half now. It's a roadmap of actions. So I talked a little bit at the beginning about the overwhelming nature of climate change and sustainability. How do I make an impact? What do I do? So our roadmap of actions defines sustainability very broadly. It includes diverse and affordable housing, includes equity and inclusion of all members of the community. It includes more typical environmental things like natural land uh, and resource protection, uh, materials management, energy efficiency, arts and culture, cleaner transportation, and so on. So sustainability really means how do we make our communities vibrant and livable in places where we want to stay, work, live, and play, and interact with each other. So we've got this roadmap of actions the towns kind of choose from that of what resonates with them. Um, then we have lots of resources and tools to help them implement those actions, including some funding. And finally, we celebrate the success. So it's a, it's a cert certification program. And we highlight the great stories that these towns and cities are taking around the state. So in our first year and a half, um, half of the towns in Connecticut have signed on to the program, which is, is great. has a lot of traction. Um, we have annual certification cycles. So our first one, 22 set towns and cities earned certification, including uh, three of our largest cities, Stamford, New Haven, and Hartford, and some of our smallest towns, Roxbury, which is under 2,500 people. Um, so our, our philosophy is... Um, a flexible program that has guidance, but lets towns adapt to what resonates with them and their local culture and where they have passion and energy as a way to really engage the entire community from the grassroots up 
to the elected leadership and staff um, to work together on these issues and share best practices with other towns. Our program is really transparent on the website. You can click on the dot for any town and see exactly what that town has done to get certified. So there's this really important peer learning element and kind of building upon what others have done and collaborating together. Um, and again, the heart of it is just creating places where we want to live and connecting with each other. The multi-benefit thing that Greg talked about as part of ecosystems and nature is part of our social fabric too. So when we create schools that are more efficient and um, uh, they're saving money, it's a more pleasant place to live because uh, to, to learn because there's daylighting and so on. So all of these things, um, it's not just about climate or just about cost. It's just about making greater communities. Thank you so much. I like the fact that you did that multifaceted look at the picture because so often we tend to think about climate change just in terms of the science or just in terms of waste or water or energy. But in fact, it's the people. And that's been brought out by most of you speaking. And I, I think everybody has talked about the people role and the social role in this. And to that, though, I'd like to turn this over to Commander Andrea Cameron, because she's looking at it for people's safety and security. She's a military professor, as we heard, in national security affairs um, and the founding director of climate and human security studies group at the U.S. Naval War College. Can you tell us first why the Navy is even concerned about climate change? Huh. Why are we concerned about climate change? There's a, a couple aspects to it in particular. First, our, around the country, we have our bases and our installations, and we're very concerned about making sure that they're sustainable in the long run. Second, we are particularly concerned about answering the call of duty when the nation needs us, that we have the training and readiness, and that is going to be impacted with uh, climate events that are perhaps taking down our training ranges, damaging our equipment, or if our forces get redirected to something uh, like a FEMA mission or another mission. And then uh, primarily with the Navy, we are a forward presence organization. We're around the globe. And with the increased severity and frequency of events, we are increasingly being called upon to respond to humanitarian assistance disaster relief missions. So those are some of the key concerns that the Navy looks at when we're talking about climate change. I also assume that your boats are at risk, your vessels, when they're out on the ocean. Our ships float, but our peers do not. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now, when it was first identified, when, so, so I'm curious, when was climate change first identified as a risk by the Navy? We as the Navy first started talking about climate change in 2009 and created Task Force Climate Change for the Department of Defense. That, organ, that unit within the Pentagon was kind of the first roadmaps and directives that came out, and now you know, we've negotiated with the other services, and we now have a DOD policy on climate change. So with that, since the Navy is thinking globally when it comes to climate change. Are they, to what extent are they thinking regionally, and in particular, how are they thinking about New England? Well, within New England, there are 21 military bases, plus a lot of other smaller stations. So the congressman mentioned that there was a recent report that was done uh, where the DOD reported back to Congress about the vulnerable bases. Now, this is kind of a good news, bad news. There are a lot of identified bases. They actually called 56 of them out by name. But there was only one of them from the New England area that was on that list. And that was the, the Cape Cod station. <coughs> so interestingly enough, uh, New England is actually considered less vulnerable from a, from a climate change perspective. And I tend to take an optimistic perspective of this, being less vulnerable to climate change. That's a potential area of growth for us within the region. Because as other bases are considered less and less sustainable, that means that within New England, we can perhaps have a greater national security goal. Thank you so much. That was a, I, I, I think that gives us a sense that New England will have a, as part of their role, there's going to be more <coughs> to think about. But at the same time, as if we're in expanding our role for the military bases, that means we're expanding our population. And we we'll probably need to start thinking about to what extent, as, a, as a, a region, if we are an area that people will 
be, a, you know, that it becomes a magnet that people are going to come to. To what extent now do our agricultural resources, our water resources, all of our resources, how are those going to come into play? So I will expect that the Navy will have something to say about that too. Um, now I'd like to turn that over to um, Mayor Bova at the other end of the panel. She is the mayor for Newport, Rhode Island, which is a city especially vulnerable to potential sea level rise. Having been an engineer at the Naval Undersea Warf Warfare Center and now as mayor, have you been able to establish parameters about combating climate change? And if so, what are they? How have you been able to engage your community of Newport in this initiative? Well, I will say as an engineer at the Naval Undersea Warfare Center that some of our boats sink, but they do it on purpose. <laughs> um, but, Seriously, um, I, you know, as an engineer, I, I tend to just look at everything as a problem to be solved and, and try to break it down um, into different components that I can, you know, kind of handle and, and, and understand better. And so I, I, the way that I try to look at it and try to set policy with the council is to break it down into different elements. Um, and, you know, the water management it is an element that I, I touched on earlier, but it is one of the biggest concerns that we have as a city, um, every element of that from the flooding issues to uh, drinking water quality. We have very good drinking water quality in the city currently, but our, um, our raw water that we source from is very vulnerable because it is, uh, many of our water sources are right next to, or right close to the coast uh, as sea level rise is very vulnerable to flooding um, and as an island, <laughs> there are only so many places we can source our water from. So it's a, it's a continued uh, risk that we have that we have to evaluate and keep an eye on and also um, attempt to plan for moving forward. Uh, and also um, a big, that sort of ties into water management is emergency response and emergency management. Um, we recently had a natural gas outage in the city of Newport in January where we had 10,000 or so people in the coldest week of winter with no heat. Um, and it was a real test of our emergency response. And it also was almost a sort of drill because it was the uh, the national grid came in and, and was able to pay for everything for the city and, and, and pay for to put residents in hotels and all of that. And there was no damage from a storm or something like that that you normally see in some sort of outage. So it was a lot safer for our folks to go out and check on residents and get residents to safety and out of their cold homes. Uh, but it did, you know, it, it reminded us in a, why it's so important to, to keep tabs on our emergency management, that we keep planning and keep testing and being prepared and training and always being prepared for the worst because we know that these storms are getting worse and we know that we're going to get these bad storms and it, we have to plan for it. Uh, and it was um, really brought home for me, the time to plan is not when you're in an emergency. The time to plan is before. Um, and we were able to really learn from that outage and, and take a lot uh, going forward from it. And we're also you know, doing a lot of work with uh, trying to understand the, the risks to our lowest lying areas and to prioritize. We're working with the Army Corps of Engineers to understand um, all of the risks to our low-lying areas that we're trying to, to model in GIS, and also um, how to prioritize those areas in, in, in emergency instances, and how to um, best reach residents and, and understand how to stay in contact with them, how to make sure they know what their risks are. Um, and again, as I said before, the biggest problem, or the one of the biggest issues that overarches all of these tasks and all of these projects that we want to, to take on is the funding issue. And, and we're looking at various pu public-private partnerships and grants, but it, it continues to be the question that we, ha that we have to unfortunately ask with every single project and that we have to plan for with every single project. Um, it, oh, in the community engagement aspect, uh, we do things kind of small and large in the city. You know, we have, um, we've had a number of, smaller community events where we teach residents about rain barrels and rain gardens to, try to kind of get people bought in on the concepts of 
what's going to happen with sea level rise and also um, help them to understand what they can do in the smallest of ways. And, and I, I know that some of the other panelists have spoken to the, the, the small, low level things that the everyday resident can do and it, and it does make an impact and it does help them be bought into the larger tasks at hand. Uh, and, and we also have a ton of community involvement and, and questionnaires going out with the Pell Bridge ramp realignment, which we're really hoping can be a model in the region for how infrastructure and development can take place in low-lying areas. The, the Pell Bridge, better known as the Newport Bridge for a lot of people, um, is are, are the ramps are being realigned by DOT, and we're gonna have a lot of new land open to development, but a lot of it is wetlands or sea level or at sea level, and we have to understand how to preserve the wetlands, how to still have development, how to build infrastructure that is resilient and sustainable. And we are uh, doing a ton of community engagement, especially because our the, the ramps, when you come off the bridge, you're right in one of the most um, vulnerable sections of our community uh, and underrepresented sections of our community where um, the, the majority of our residents live in the north end of the city and the majority of our low income residents live in the north end of the city. And so it's uh, really on us as, um, elected officials to make sure that they are very much those residents who are going to be the most affected are the most engaged with and that we go out of our way to engage with them and, and go to where they are. And that's been a big part of it is not just holding um, community engagement events in City Hall, which is in the sort of <coughs> mid southern area of the city, going to the north end, going to the community centers in the north end of the city, going to where the people are and asking that and, and, and asking them for their input in an area they're comfortable in. You have just made an amazing segue. <laughs> <laughs> because the next part of our program is going to where the people are, our audience here and our audience globally. But before I do that, and, and thank you so much for your um, insights, Mir Bova, everybody in this panel, thank you. We're going to continue to talk with you, but to hear your personal uh, experience and wisdom has given us a broad spectrum from uh, all the issues that are at hand. There's certainly some of the most extraordinary challenges that we will have ever faced, but yet it's catapulting us together as people, as communities, and as a world. And in doing so, I think we're getting to a point where we can start seeing these solutions and, and seeing ways to uh, respond to them. And I'd like to bring the perspective of um, you have um, I'd like to bring the perspective of uh, Mr. Sean Summers. He is a businessman in Boston, and he has seven pubs, and has recently come to re recognize how important climate change is. So we wanted to find out what are the concerns a small business has most about climate change, and what are some of the things you're doing that can make a difference. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sean Summers. Uh, I own and my, myself and my family own and operate the Summers uh, Hospitality Group in Boston, uh, which is comprised of nine um, Irish pubs. Uh, and Karen asked me this question, what was the pulse on small businesses and um, how do it, what is the concerns? And the way uh, I sourced it out was asking some other business owners, you know, and what I got back was, you know, small business owners are in small business because they usually don't do well with being told what to do. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like be bosses. They want to be their own boss. They want to blaze their own trail. They want to uh, fly their own flag. They want to do their own thing, get up, have their own hours. That being said, um, to be your own boss means that you have to be, uh, you know, ear to the grindstone working hard, keeping an eye on all aspects of your operations, and that uh, make, takes up a lot of time. And with that, uh, you know, with all that time being devoted towards your business, um, businesses are afraid, uh, one, of being told what to do, so they look to their, uh, the leaders to be, uh, to be doing what they're supposed to be doing to be telling them of the initiatives of, um, I, just, uh, I just got a liquor license, I'm opening a new uh, restaurant. I should be told about the, uh, the more uh, efficient uh, coolers I can buy 
and you know maybe dropping down the, the length of time it will take for me to process my application if I do buy a refrigeration that's going to lessen my carbon footprint. You know, these are the things that they can be introduced to that won't take up their time through the, the people who, who are elected in government. And, and they're saying that they're not being introduced to these new sustainable, more efficient ways of doing business. And I punt that over to the leaders that that are, or you know, the, the elected officials to, to introduce these more efficient, sustainable ways to the person going to get the application for a small business, which if they did this, this, and this that were green and more sustainable, more sustainable, then their application would be pushed through faster. Um, and anybody who is in business successfully, you know, is a bottom line driven person, you know, I am a type of person who, you know, likes to cut cost and and boost profit. And through that, you know, I've realized that that might not be always the best way. And I've started to really look at things about, you know, how are small businesses going to react? And, and I realize a lot of them are afraid of, how do I take the first step? How do I take the first step? And so I took it upon myself. And Karen went to the New England Aquarium, and we're starting the First Step Initiative for Small Businesses. That's what it's called, the First Step. And it's, uh, it's about uh, driving straws, you know, the, uh, the use of straws, or the one-time use of plastics, out of, you know, out of existence. Um, my business alone went through almost a half a million straws last year. And I could drive that to zero if I chose to. So I'm going to make that choice. Well, I can't take them completely out of play. I have to make them available, but I can make a lot out of play. <laughs> so by bringing this awareness to the small business, uh, the entrepreneur, you know, it gives them a first step initiative. It takes up a lot of your time running a business. So you need to make the ease of entry for people who genuinely do care to do these things. So if Thank not... You're very welcome. So, you know, uh, we're starting this, uh, this new campaign, and, and that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Uh, that really makes another great segue, because I think now we have a little bit more of the practical side. It's one thing for us to think about policies. It's one thing for us to think about our cities and our, our resources and our budgets. But it's the other thing to see how our cities are working with our businesses, our small businesses, and what they're up against. I think another issue that came out of that was time. And time is something for all of us. It's time on the city level. It's time on an individual household level. People who are working two jobs and raising children, they don't have that much time to think about what to do to help the environment. Small business is the same. Many of us the same. We're, 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 almost all overworked and underpaid. But that doesn't mean that we can't take a moment to learn from sessions like this, from um, bringing the community together at moments, whether it's at church, whether it's at school, whether it's at the workplace, getting to the community and, and working through processes, as you suggest, the political, uh, the permit process. So there are a number of touch points that I believe we can that we are touching upon that make a lot of sense. What I would like to do now is find out from you, the audience, and I believe someone's also checking the global audience. If we're thinking regionally, because obviously here we're represented from across several states, do we accept climate change as being inevitable and begin to adapt? And if so, how? Or is there still a way to reduce the impact of climate change? And if so, how? So I'm curious, we are curious from the Foundation for a Green Future standpoint, from the standpoint of Renewable Now Network, what is it that we're looking at? And so I'd, I'd like to start out with this young man in the front row. Um, Hi. Uh, I just want to say how excited Would I am. I'd like to say who you are. Yeah. Hi. My name is Brian Braggington Smith, uh, and uh, just wanted to... Uh, account how, how excited I am to be here. Uh, 
I have to acknowledge and, uh, and confess that uh, Greg Watson and I uh, go way back. Uh, in fact, before there was before there was a Cape Wind, uh, before there was uh, a uh, Vineyard Wind, uh, there was something called Ocean Ranch. Uh, and Greg and I uh, were the ones that uh, that moved forward with that, trying to make that happen. Uh, that was uh, that was about 30 years ago, really. Uh, and uh, and at that time, uh, uh, what what we found out was that you couldn't get there from here. Uh, because there were no le regulations, there were no statutes in order to be able to do it. The exciting thing today, and what I really want to stress here now, is that we need to point to successes. We need to point to things that we are doing that show people around the globe that we are taking action. We've got thousands of megawatts of offshore wind planned for this region. Yep. That is a world-leading initiative. We are not sitting back on our haunches waiting for somebody else to solve the problem. We recognize the crisis, and it is a crisis, and it is upon us right now. But we are decisively taking action, and not just in the offshore wind realm. We're talking about sustainable communities. We're talking about holistic approaches to understanding that we are intricately connected with nature, and if we don't recognize that fact, we are through. Thank you. This is what it is and about. in fact, we are through. Our time has started to... I just, got, <laughs> I just got word that our time is getting short. So in fact, I guess we've had such an incredible discussion with the two questions that we asked that we're getting to the point where we like to continue this discussion, but it will have to be offline, and hopefully the questions that we do get will be able to, and comments, will be able to continue the discussion through many other means. But what I'd like to do very quickly is, uh, do we have the award? Is call everybody up really quickly, one by one. Um, let's see. We have an eco-educated award for the Cardi's Furniture. Is somebody here from Cardi's? Yes? No? All right. All right, well, thank you. Thank you so much for sponsoring this wonderful event. Hold on just a sec. Turn here. Okay. All right. Beautiful. Thank you. Arpin Group. At least one of you, come over here in your green shirt. We're very happy to rep to have the Arpin Group represented. They've been amazing educators. I will meet you halfway. <laughs> Thank you. Wait, wait. Okay. You got it? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mayor Jamie Bova. Thank you as an eco educator. We are so happy to have you here and all the wonderful work you do. Oh. Commander Cameron, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Red Watson, your many, many years of service. Thank you. Thank you. Juan Aurelia Lopez, oh, thank you. We'll get it away from your face. <laughs> Deborah Brown. <laughs> Alyssa Bitterman. Thank you for coming from me. <laughs> Troy, also from Maine. Thank you for your wonderful work. Lynn. Thank you for being here from Connecticut and doing that. And that's it? Everyone's got one? <laughs> Fantastic. So to wrap up quickly, I want to thank our sponsors. I want to thank New England Institute of Technology for allowing us to use this space. I want you all to remember to connect with your elected officials, your community, get involved, keep everyone abreast of your ideas. And this is a community event, a call to action. So we're all called to action. 
next big action we expect you all to do is be at Boston Green Fest Yay! in August, from the 16th to the 18th. Let's do it the green way on the green way. But really, thank you to all our illustrious panelists. They've done a fantastic job. We've, um, and to all of our audience for being with us tonight, thank you. Thank you.